Today, I'm going to show you how to clean an airbrush, what kind of paint I prefer. I'm going to be reviewing or sharing my new Grex airbrush, giving you a tutorial of these broses in colored pencil, and just a lot of stuff. You should probably just pause this and go get a drink. This video is going to be really long. Starting with the air compressor, you can see it's got a little holder for the airbrush, completely impractical. Not something that, that works for me because I keep the airbrush on the floor next to my easel. So that's not something I'm going to use, but it's there if you want it. The compressor is very, very small. As you can see next to the, that's a pretty standard sized coffee cup, really tiny. It's quieter than your standard hair dryer, or at least the ones that I have. It's quite a bit quieter than that. You're going to control your PSI or the air pressure that you're getting by that black knob right on top of the dial guy there. You will just turn that to increase or decrease that. And I usually keep mine pretty low. You don't need a ton of air pressure if you're doing a lot of finer detail. If you're doing something huge and you need the air just blasting out you're using especially if you're using like a larger needle you may want to turn that up but for anything that I've done with fine art this compressor is perfect for everything I've tried it with so far since I store my compressor or use it down at the floor that's not a convenient place for me to hold my airbrush so I've got this airbrush holder also by Grex this sounds like a Grex commercial I'm not sponsored by them this is all stuff I purchased myself but this one holds up to four airbrushes I just have the one but it's really convenient and it just clamps right onto my easel so it makes it really easy I can move it around it's easy access to get to that airbrush really quickly whenever I need it for the paints, my two favorites are the Golden High Flow Acrylics. This one's probably my absolute favorite because I love the bottle, the tips. I make way less mess applying just a couple drops of this into my airbrush than I do the other. The other one that I really like is the Holbein Airbrush Paints. Both are wonderful paints. I really don't have a huge problem with them clogging. They, the consistency is really good. I don't have to thin them out at all. I do add a couple of drops of airbrush flow improver before I add the paint, and this really keeps my airbrush from clogging. I used to, if you've watched some of my old videos, I talked about the constant clogging of my airbrush part. I was using a paint, the Createx paint, with the wrong size needle. The needle was way too small for the that type of paint. So they, there are things you can thin out to make that work, which I've done before, but I still had problems with it clogging. With these two paints, I have not had any trouble. It's wonderful to work in and not <laughs> constantly be fighting trying to clog or unclog the airbrush. The other thing that I've done that helps to keep my airbrush from clogging is cleaning it properly. And this was something that I just failed at for years. I just wasn't doing it right. So here's my out of focus bottle of airbrush cleaner. I love this stuff. I'll have all of my supplies linked in the video description. I usually use about 50% of this and 50% water in a small cup to soak everything. Now, if I clean my airbrush, right away after I've used it. I really don't have to soak it for very long. Maybe 10 minutes is fine. 10, 10 15 minutes will get everything out. If you do like I do and forget and let it set for a day, two days, a week, and that paint really seems to want to harden in there, you're going to want to let it soak a little bit longer. I've let it soak up to, well, actually one, I had let get so damaged for so many years of not cleaning right. I had to soak it for a couple of days and clean in between. But usually overnight is the most I would ever have to do. And normally I don't even have to do that long. Now, what I'm doing is taking that cleaner. I've got a ton of different brushes. Again, those are linked in the video description that I'm going to clean all of the parts off on that gun. And you're going to remove everything. You just unscrew all of the parts. This section here, that front cap is used by a magnet out of focus again, which is amazing because I take that off while I'm airbrushing. It builds up paint. So I usually remove it, but it protects the needle. So you don't want to keep it off all the time. So I end up constantly putting it on and off. My old Iwata, I had to screw it on and off. Not a big deal. This is just way faster because of the magnet. Now I'm going to just, again, unscrew everything. The back end, I can just set to the side. I Unless I get paint all over it, I'll use a toothbrush with my cleaner to clean that. Unscrew that back nut and then pull the needle out. Now the needle, I am not going to put that and soak it in the water because you have to be so careful of not damaging the tip of the needle. This is the, the biggest thing you want to watch on your, your airbrush. Keep, just protect that needle like crazy because once that bends you have to replace it and on this gun it comes as a full set you don't just buy the needle you buy the tip and, or the nozzle and all kinds of things together and it's like a $40 purchase depending on the needle size that you have so really protect that needle you want it to last as long as possible and it can last for years if you are really careful so I'm going to just clean that off take my paper towel and wipe that down you're welcome for my super out of focus video you, you get the point. You can see what's happening. 
I'm going to set that to the side again, not going to stick in the cup because I don't want to damage the tip. Now I'm going to use this little tool that comes with it. When you buy new needles, it comes with that. I'm going to unscrew that nozzle. Now when you put the nozzle back on, be so careful. Don't over tighten that. I've stripped those before and it really sucks. So I'm going to unscrew that, stick that in my cup of cleaner and water mixture. And now I'm going to take some of the other tools and again, just scrub out the inside. Now, some people will tell you, don't ever use anything that has metal. Some of the scrubbers that I use do. I use the bristled ones, not the ones that have straight metal. I don't want to rub metal on metal, but the bristled brushes I feel comfortable with. I've never had a problem with those. But I'm going to clean that out as good as I can get any chunks of paint. And this one had sat for about a week before I realized, oh crap, I forgot to wash this. I'm just going to rinse that out. And I'm setting it in, just the front half of it is sitting in there. Now, you you don't want to soak your airbrush for too long because you can cause damage to the valves and different things. But honestly, I've soaked it for a day here and there and never had a problem. I'm sure it depends on the airbrush, but this has been a method that worked really well for me for keeping it really clean so I don't have dried paint come loose while I'm working and clog the nozzle. Now, these little bristled brushes are so great. I love them for cleaning out the inside of that airbrush. There's nothing really small enough that works super well for the nozzle. Now, this nozzle is kind of large. I can use the smallest bristled brush for the outer or the just the, the largest portion, but it's not going to get all the way in there. That's why I really like to soak that nozzle. So once it's all done, I'm going to screw the nozzle back on. Now, first, I actually want to get a little bit of my airbrush the oil, which apparently I didn't put on this one yet. But normally I will use a few drops of the lubricant to make sure that the metal parts are not grinding together and causing problems there. I'm also going to hopefully at some point, yep, there I go. I realized I forgot to put the lubricant on that. So I'm going to grab that first. Whoops. Going to take that off and drop it. Watch that. Those tips are, are the nozzle so teeny, teeny, tiny. Be very careful. You don't want like an open sink because you will lose that nozzle. So there's my airbrush lubricant. I'm just going to put a little bit on the tip of the needle. I'm going to put that in first. And you can run the needle through the back of the brush or through the front. I usually will run through the front just so I have less chance of damaging the tip of that needle. So you can see running right back through the front. And I just put the lubricant on the front half of the needle. That That's generally, that was what was recommended to me when I first started. It's worked well. So I'm not going to tighten that nut in the back yet until I get the nozzle. Everything else is going to go into place first. So I've got a little bit of that lubricant on the tip of the nozzle. Going to screw that in with my hands and then just barely tighten it just a little bit. Don't, you don't need this super tight. If you get it too tight, you're going to have problems or you can strip it. So... There is that part. I'm going to put the next piece on. And again, just get a little bit of, I don't need much. Like at the tiniest amount of this lubricant goes a very long way. Like it's not even a full drop. It barely touches. I'm just using my finger to kind of spread that around. Going to put the next piece on. Now, once that's on, I'm going to take my needle, push it forward with my hand. And while I'm pushing it forward, don't push too hard. Tighten that nut. And that's going to allow the needle to push forward and pull back. Don't forget to tighten the nut or the needle will not move. And now my little magnet piece goes on front and then I can put the back end on. And the same thing with the back end. Basically anything with the metal that is one area screws onto another, I'm just going to add a little bit of the lubricant. Now, honestly, I don't add this every single time. I do add it every single time to the needle, but some of these other parts, I don't, every time I pull it apart, I don't always add it. I'd say maybe half the time. And that has worked out well for me. You've got to make sure that that back end is tightened just or sets just right in order for it to really screw on right. And then you've also got a little screw on the back of the gun where if you have a hard time where you pull when you're the trigger back too far and air and paint just squirts out too fast, you can tighten that so it'll keep you from being able to let that much paint out all at once. I don't usually do that because I've been doing this long enough. I have enough control, but that is something you can do if you're having a hard time. We'll put the little grip back on there and that is it for cleaning it. One time I did get paint in the trigger area and had to pull that apart and clean it too, but that's the same way. You're just going to pull it apart, clean it, and then put everything back together.
And one really quick thing on this specific model, you can see it's got this little cover that you can have over the trigger. I hate the cover. I take it off. I feel like I have so much less control with that. And part of it, maybe I've been airbrushing for 20 years and I'm not used to having that there. So that part I do take off, but the this part of the grip, I love that. And it just slides on and off. You do have to remove the hose in order to get that on or off. But that portion of the grip, the bottom section, I really like because that metal section you see there pushing on my finger at the bottom, just the way that I hold the gun, that ends up really hurting my finger. So this grip that they have on it is, oh, I love it so, so much. It's a really comfortable gun to paint with. Now we can move on to the demonstration portion. If you are supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over there where the over two hour, I think it's like two hour and 20 minute version of this lesson is available for you now, along with the reference photo if you wanted to paint along with me. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer one to two hour, sometimes three hour long tutorials complete with voiceover. There are over 150 of them that you can watch instantly as soon as you sign up. There's also, if you just want to see if Patreon is something you're interested in, I have a free over, I want to say two hour long Margay and colored pencil video that you can just go to the website. You don't even have to sign up and watch right now. Step one for me was to take some frisket and line my board. This is the Cans and Me Tans art board. So I don't have to tape it to anything. It's just really easy to work on. I'm Seriously, this is turning into one of my favorite papers to work on with colored pencil. Definitely a really nice one for airbrush. For airbrush, ideally, you wanna work on a surface that is really, really smooth because if it has much tooth, it's going to catch in all of those ridges and it ends up having a rougher look than what airbrush typically can do. So I really like a much smoother look. And you can see how I've got everything drawn out with the graphite line. And now I'm taking an X-Acto knife. Now this part I can't stress enough, that X-Acto knife is so sharp. If it's very dull, I'm gonna have to push harder to try to cut through the frisket. Frisket is basically like a big sheet of clear tape. And I'm using a very low tack version. I tried a higher tack one earlier, or another roll that I didn't realize was too, was too high tack, and it ripped part of the surface of my paper. I'll show you that once we get started. You can see it in the finished piece. I knew this wasn't gonna be one I was selling. I, I just wanted to practice some different techniques. So, it wasn't a big deal for me. I wasn't going to redraw it or start over again. But you want a low tack. If you're working on something like this, a low tack tape and the frisket one, and I'll have that linked in the video description. That one works really, really well. You can see how I'm really slowly pulling this off. Now, the point of this is to mask out where the roses and the basket are going to be so that I can be really messy when I paint the background. So while, yes, this took a fair amount of time. You see how slowly I have to pull this and then recut anywhere that I didn't cut through all the way. But as much as it seems like this took a long time, to cut everything out in the long run. It really saves a ton of time versus having to try to be super careful around my subject and not get paint over it. So frisket is really, really handy when you're not wanting to be super careful about something like this. And I'm just gonna slowly, slowly pull all of that frisket off and I'm leaving the tape on the roses and the basket. Once I've got everything cut out, I can go ahead and head over to the easel and I can start airbrushing. So I'm going to start by airbrushing just a base brown for that background. I don't need anything to be detailed at this point. I'm going to end up painting a brick, an out of focus brick background and wood grain for the foreground. Right now, I just wanna get the white of the paper covered and you can see I'm going really slow. Now, when you're painting something like this and you want it to be smooth, go off the paper. Don't, I'm not wiggling the airbrush back and forth loosely where I, if you do that, you end up with harsh start and stop points. So what I'm doing, I'm pressing down on the trigger and pulling back as I make the brush stroke when I get to the end I push the trigger forward and let up and that is a really important thing that you want to get used to doing push down pull back push forward let go if you and a lot of people I mean I did when I first started you want to just push the trigger down and pull back and get all the paint going and you just let it go when you're done or when you're done painting you're going to clog the tip that way so that's why you want to get in the habit and it turns into just second nature push down on that trigger pull back when you're done with that that brush stroke push forward, let go. And I wanna make sure I'm pulling that airbrush all the way off the side of that paper so that I don't have that harsh start and stop point. Now, if, this doesn't have to be perfectly smooth, so I don't have to be really careful since I am going to be painting a textured background. But that is something I cannot stress enough. Push down, pull back, push forward, 
let go. That's on the trigger. Just be very careful. Now you can see here, look at how I'm not using the grip. I bought this gun before I bought the grip, the extra thing. This is why I was stupid when I bought this. I should have just bought the kit, everything together, but I bought everything individual, realized that it was really uncomfortable without that grip. So that's why you see me working without it initially. Now, for the first part of this, I'm using a 0.3 needle. That's a pretty standard size needle, and if you're only going to get one needle, I do recommend the 0.3. I think it just works well for most things. I love the 0.2 on this one, and one of the things that I love about this specific gun, one of the things that really drew me to this, it is it's set up to be completely interchangeable. I can change the needle size and have only one airbrush. I don't need three different airbrushes if I want my 0.5, before I had two, one with a 0.5, one with a 0.3. If I wanted a 0.2, I would have to have another airbrush. But with the Grex system, everything is interchangeable and that alone is just priceless to me. So I've got a 0 0.3, 0 0.2 and a 0 0.5 needle for this gun. I don't think I'll use the 0.5 too often. That's if I had something really large I was filling in. More paint is going to come out, the larger the needle, the bigger space, I guess, that you, that you would be filling in. With this one, when I want the tiny, tiny detail, I'm gonna switch to the 0.2, and that was a really, really nice size to work on for the fine detail. But like I said, if you're only going to get one needle, go with the 0.3. I think it's a nice, just kind of average size needle that will work for most of the things you're going to do. For all the time before this project, I, the smallest I've ever worked on on my other work, now typically I only use the airbrush for background, so I don't need a lot of fine detail, but the 0.3 is the majority of what you've seen me use in the past on my Iwata. Now, if you are hesitant to try the airbrush, getting blurry out of focus backgrounds is one of the easiest things to do. You can do that your very first day. You'll have no problems. Getting finer details, that's where it's going to take control and practice. Getting straight lines, well, mine aren't straight. They're not supposed to be straight there. But when you want to get straight lines or you just want to have control, that will come with practice. And it takes a lot of practice. So don't get frustrated with that. And I usually recommend people when you're first getting started with the airbrush just to practice and get a hang of, the hang of it, use an old cardboard box or some kind of cheap consumer construction paper. Don't use expensive paper to start with. This isn't something where you're you're going to have enough control in the beginning to make something super amazing other than an out of focus background. And even then, before you start that, I would do at least a quick sample on like a piece of cardboard just to get the hang of things. But the closer that you get the airbrush to the paper or to your surface, the finer your line is going to be. Now you need to counter that by not having as much pressure coming through or uh, releasing as much paint. Because if you ha are releasing as much paint up close as you might for making a a soft out of focus background, you can get these hot spots where the paint kind of splatters. So just go slow, play with it. And in this case, I'm making this out of focus brick background and then the wood base. This looks like a hot mess at this point. That is fine. Nothing needs to look good yet. I'm going to layer until it does look good. And if you're using opaque paints, it's a lot more forgiving than if you're using all translucent because the translucent paints, while I love them and I use them a ton, at least half my paints are translucent. You want, if you have a mistake, especially when you're first learning in the beginning, those mistakes are really, really hard to cover up. You're always going to see them a little bit. Here, if you're mixing both, you can cover things with an opaque layer. And I'm not gonna say that's the best way to go in the long run, but while you're learning, it it does make it easier. It makes it a bit more forgiving to cover something if you had a splatter, if you had something that just went terribly wrong. Now, I want to show you really quickly how I change colors in my airbrush. I take a spray bottle with a high stream, and I'm missing because I'm trying to look through the camera, so I apologize. I'm making more of a mess than necessary, but I'm going to spray that to get as much paint. I will dump as much paint as possible, but I'm going to spray that to get more of the paint out of the gun right there. And then I'm just gonna blow water through this. And I've got my little container down below, you can see with the little hole, which is, I'll have a car pop up and show you. That's typically where I'm going to run it through, but I'm using the paper towel. You can see how much of that paint is still in there. Now switching from black, which is super, super dark, up to a lighter color, it's usually better to go ahead and switch out the colors, clean the airbrush before putting your new color in. But I will run that through to where most of the, the paint that I was previously using is out of the gun. I'm gonna wipe that out and I can run some airbrush cleaner through that. I've got one by Createx. I have a bunch of airbrush cleaners from different companies. They all work about the same. It's just whichever one's cheaper at the time and more convenient to get. So this one's just the Createx and I'm going to again run that through there. Now normally that little pot that you're seeing, that's where I would stick the airbrush in there and run it through that way. That way I'm not releasing all of these cleaners or all of the airbrush paint out into the air. While the paints that I'm using are non-toxic, they can cause problems if you 
you are breathing too much of them in. I had a, a situation when I first started airbrushing. I was airbrushing so much and I didn't realize how much of the paint was building up in the air I was in or I'm sorry, the room that I was in. And I looked over and there's just this cloud of airbrush paint. Now it doesn't stain or ruin your furniture. It doesn't hurt, hurt anything as far as that goes. The problem is I had breathed so much in, again, non-toxic, but it coated my lungs so that I wasn't receiving the oxygen I needed. And I was sick. It took me three or four days for that to work itself out with me coughing up some really interesting colors that are uh, it's gross but I was really like it really caused problems I was dizzy for for those few days because again not getting enough oxygen so I do recommend wearing a mask an air mask and I know a lot of people say you don't need them you know what I was one of those people who yeah I was doing it wrong you know I was I was using more paint because I was working on a huge painting indoors in an area that didn't have good airflow so yeah my own fault but wearing an air mask would have prevented what happened to me so I generally wear an air ma mask if I'm airbrushing very much. If it's a tiny, quick little area, I don't necessarily always put the mask on. But since then, if it's a big area, that mask goes on. I don't just assume because something's non-toxic that it can't cause problems. So just a little tip there. And when you mix your paint, I mix mine directly into the airbrush. I only need a couple of, of drops of each color in most cases. Just a little bit does go a long way. I will put in more if I'm filling out a large background, but for the most part, just it, it really doesn't take a lot of paint. Those little tubes that you saw me show earlier, those last a very, very long time. So I don't need a lot and I can mix it right in the airbrush. However, it does get annoying, and I found that when I started airbrushing the roses, there are certain colors that I was having a hard time blending from what I had. Yeah, you can blend in another vial, but you end up wasting, or at least I feel like you waste a lot of paint unless you need a lot of that color. So I ended up going after I started the, the roses and buying a whole lot more airbrush paint. I got mine from dickblick.com. So as I go through here, now onto the roses, you can see that I went ahead and put the frisket back over where the airbrush was. I had saved the original piece. I found, and I've, I've done this before, I always try to make that work, and yeah, you can, but it's hard to line up because that, that frisket kind of, or that big piece of tape essentially, sort of stretches and moves and it's really hard to line up perfectly. So it's a lot easier when getting into the smaller details, I think, just to not use it and just be careful where you put the the airbrush paint. Just try to be very controlled in this. Now, as I went for these first three airbrush or roses, I really don't like the method that I used to paint them. I was adding the color where I thought I wanted the color to go and it was actually making things way harder for myself. I wasn't super happy with the results that I was getting, mainly because I was spending so much time trying to mix the perfect color of paint and then glazing over with the translucent colors to, to adjust it. And I found, and you'll see this on the last two roses, it was so much easier just to use a raw umber color or a brown, any of your brown tones will, really would work and do all of my shading that way and then just glaze the color I wanted on top of it. Also, I had bought, like I said, I went back through after I got about one or two of these roses in, I stopped. I didn't work on this for a bit. I went ahead and ordered more paint because I just didn't have the colors. I was sick of mixing colors. Again, it can be done, but I felt like I was wasting so much time trying to get the perfect color and I would use too much of the paint that I had in trying to get that. So it's just very wasteful. So it made more sense financially and time-wise just to go ahead and get the colors I needed because I didn't have a lot of pinks. I have a lot of, of colors that I can mix pinks from, but it was it was definitely becoming quite a hassle. So I just kept layering and layering until I got this rose to be about where I wanted it to be. Now, once I got to a certain point, I went through with my colored pencils, mostly my luminance on this because they're more opaque and they, they stood out better against the darker background. But I'm going to use my colored pencils to refine details. You don't have to use colored pencils to get a lot of detail in your airbrush. This was also, I was still using my 0.3 needle. I ordered the 0.2 after this one where I was like, I need, I need more details. But you can use your colored pencil to, to refine things or just use it as a base for knowing you're going to go with on top of this with colored pencils. There's also a lot of different tools that you can use. You'll see me use more later on that will allow you to get hard edges. So you can either make a cutout with some like thick paper. I like thick paper better just so that the, the paint doesn't soak into it, but, and it, it holds its shape a lot nicer, or you can use different types of stencils that are intended for the airbrush. There are tons of them like I'm using right there and it allows me to get a sharp edge 
on one side, which is perfect for this. And you can see I can start getting these nice crisp lines. This worked way better and I like the results. I got better when I did everything like this with the sepia tones or the, the raw umber first before putting the color on top. I definitely, the way that I'm doing this right now, made things way harder on myself than what was necessary. And like I've said before, I really don't do a lot of fine detail with airbrushing. So this was kind of a refresher course for myself of let's practice. I mean, I know the concept. I know how to do the detail, but you do get out of practice. Just the way that you hold the gun, the way that you allow the airflow to come through. So giving myself some time to just play around with this. Like I said before too, I knew I was not going to be selling this. So I don't care if there's mistakes. I don't, it didn't make a huge deal. I knew I'd make a lesson out of it, but I figure I can just share the thing that went wrong online so you guys can avoid some of those but I'm just gonna keep layering and layering color working back and forth like it, I wasted it, it still cracks me up how much longer this rose took than the bottom two but the bottom two looked I felt so so much better just because of the techniques that I used and the way that I laid the paint down and of course this was my first detailed one when after being out of practice with getting detail on on an airbrush so that would would definitely impact that as well so now I'm going over with the colored pencil. Now here's a big thing. If you're going to use colored pencil, you can't use colored pencil and then go over that area with the airbrush. The airbrush is a water-based paint. Your colored pencils are wax and oil-based. So you don't want to go back and forth between the two. Save your colored pencils for the very end. So if I were to do this one again, if I were doing something very serious where I knew I was going to sell it, I am not going to even touch this piece with colored pencil until I'm completely done with the airbrush. Because technically, when I went through and started airbrushing the Bases or the glass jars, some of that airbrush paint, I'm sure got a, a little bit of overspray onto the colored pencil. And that's definitely not going to be archival. You don't want to put a wax or oil-based product underneath or put an oil bait. Wow. I can't talk. A Let's try that again. You don't want to put a water-based product over the wax or oil-based pencil. Just it's not going to stick long-term. So here I did simplify this a little bit more where I'm just kind of blocking in my basic red color. So this one, I, it, while it's more simple than the first one, it's a better way to go. The next two roses were way better. Again, just starting everything with two tones, my raw umber, and then if I needed to put highlights with white, I can, and then glaze color over. So this is kind of moving towards that, the it, basically a Grizzel method, but not quite there yet, and still, still took a, a bit more time than it would have had I done the me method you'll see in a few moments. And you can just layer on top of layer on top of layer. And most of these colors that I'm using at this point are very translucent. So you're still going to see the color underneath and you can build up a lot of depth that way. Translucent colors with airbrush, once you get comfortable with them, you can build up such beautiful depth where the light will refract through each layer that you painted. So it's a really good way to go. But um, here, I, the white that I'm using is very opaque. So I'm now flattening up everywhere that I'm putting this. And I'll put color on top of that. But whenever you're using the colors the way that I'm doing here, this is almost a sloppy, lazy way of going. It's not going to look as nice if I would have just let the white of the paper show through or stay light to begin with. Going back through with the white, I'm losing some of those translucent layers in doing it that way. While you're learning go back and forth all you want. The point when you're first starting, just get a feel for, for controlling that airbrush, get a feel for that paint. But once you get more advanced, it's going to be better if you keep your opaque colors for your base layers and do a lot of translucent layers on top. You're going to get so much more depth that way. It, it's very much like oil paint or acrylic painting. So now I'm coming through with more of the colored pencil. And now I, you'll see I can really sharpen up edges. I can clean things up and it's very fast. I did not spend very long with those pencils. I'm using some luminance. I'm using some, I think some of those are the Derwent drawings. Some may be the, uh, not drawing, the Derwent, uh, what are they? The Pro Color. May have thrown some light fast ones in there as well. I was just kind of playing with everything to see what which pencils I like better on top of this. The majority of this though, I do like the luminance. They're one of my more opaque colors. So going, getting it to show up over the dark background that I've already airbrushed works really well. And this paper was wonderful. Those pencils stuck so well on top of the airbrush and on top of this specific paper. I was really happy with the results there. I'm 
nearly positive the next time I place an order uh, with Dick Blick, I will end up ordering a quite a few more of these. And these sheets, this one is a 16 by 20. You can, I think they might come smaller. If they don't, you can just cut it down to whatever size that you want. So I could cut it into maybe four smaller pieces. In this case, if I'm using the airbrush background, it doesn't take long to fill up a 16 by 20 inch. So I don't see myself cutting it down. I probably would just continuously work big because, you know, I'm lazy. I'll just use the size it came in. But you could get several pieces out of the one and it is a thick board. So again, not having to tape anything down to another drawing board like I would if I used, when I used the Fabriano Artistico or something like that. It handled the water media very well. The only thing is, and you can kind of see it above the rows right there that I'm working on. There's one of the areas where the initial frisket that I tried using had too much, it was too tacky and it tore the paper when I lifted it. So that this paper is a, a little bit more delicate I would say than the Fabriano I've used that paper on on other or that specific brisket and not had it tear like it did on this paper so you know good idea to test it first test whatever brisket you're using beforehand and even when I used the the other brisket the one that that was lower tack I still took that brisket and dabbed it onto the carpet or my my jeans I forget which I did some kind of, of fabric to pick up those fibers so that it was even less tacky so because I knew this paper being as delicate as it was really didn't want that ripping through any more than I already had now if this was something I was going to sell and I ripped up parts of that even before I started painting you can still see it through and I'll point that out again when when you can see it depending on where the camera angle is but you could always see those areas that were torn up, I wouldn't sell this. I never would sell something that had a tear. So if it was something like a commission or something I was going to sell, I would have started over on a fresh sheet of paper. But if you do damage something like what I did here, it's great for practice. The rest, I mean, the paper was fine to paint on. It was just those few areas that are, are pretty noticeable where it tore. Or it, it didn't tear through because it's bored. It kind of just pulled up some of the surface. So painting in these vases, now part of this is available on the live stream, so you can see how I'm working a lot of this area, or some of these, these jars anyway, on the live stream, so you, you can watch that in real time. I'll have a card pop up, so you can check that out. And just like everywhere else, I'm just going to layer. I made the dark background, so I the same browns that I used initially, I want to say that one was probably raw, sea, or raw umber, and then going through, adding some highlights, and then I'll go back through with shadows with the black, and I'm, or really, it's a, more of a dark brown, but I'm going to work my way back and forth, building up my lights and my darks. And there was another tool you saw kind of flash on the screen really quick there. I'm using that to keep my edges perfectly smooth, using a postcard to get straight lines. There are so many things that you may have laying around the house that you can use when you're airbrushing as a sort of stencil. So while I have a ton of stencils that I use with airbrushing, if I want something straight, more often than not, I'm just going to go grab a postcard or a, or a sheet of paper the size that I need. And the postcard I really liked because it was small, it was easy to maneuver into whatever area that I needed for on this piece. Coming through with the darks now. So when I'm working on these glass jars, the thing that's so important are my values. My color, not a big deal. It's brown, black, and white, essentially. I mean, some of it will have a little bit more of a reddish brown. Some will have a, a more grayish brown. But the majority, what I'm really focusing on here, get my brights bright enough, my darks dark enough. That's what's going to make this glass look like glass. Make, give it that very, very shiny look. If my white, as you can see here, that white right now is not bright enough. And so it doesn't really look like glass. It's just kind of this foggy or almost like a more opaque glass. That is what it would look like. But I want it to look really crystal clear. So I'm going to need my darks way darker and I'm going to need my lights way brighter. Now that first jar isn't finished. I mean, I, I'm kind of skip around back and forth as I'm working through here. It's I'll finish them all pretty much at the same time. I'm just going to start layering basic details in there. So onto this wire basket. I thought that was going to be the biggest pain in the world to paint. It wasn't, it was actually really fun. And it was such great practice for that fine detail, for having a lot of control. Now at this point I am using the 0.2 needle. So really tiny detail in there. I don't have my PSI very high. I, it's, um, it's always on the floor when I'm working, so I can't see what it is. It's under 10, I'm pretty sure. But it's very, very low. Um, 
and I'm not releasing a lot of paint. I'm not pulling that trigger all the way back. The farther back you pull that trigger, it's going to release more paint. I don't wanna release a lot of paint here. And if I release a lot of paint and not enough air, you've gotta balance those because you'll start getting spitting happening. If you're having spitting happening on your airbrush, one of, well, many things can be causing it. But one thing may be that you've got too much paint coming out and not enough air. It could be too much air and not enough paint can cause some problems. Or the splattering effect that is almost like a spider leg coming out. You'll see that as soon as you start airbrushing. You'll you'll know what I'm talking about. You'll you'll see it firsthand. Um, that is all going to, to have to do with balancing how much paint you're releasing from the gun versus what your PSI is set at and how close or how far away the airbrush is to the can or the paper. The closer you are to the paper, the finer the detail is going to be you pull it back further when you want that more soft out of focus look like what I've done on the background so here that airbrush is really really close one thing I should point out too it looks like based on this camera angle that I am coming at the paper from an angle and I'm not that is always at a 90 well I mean I guess technically it's an angle but a, a sharper angle I'm always at a 90 degree angle that airbrush is straight at the paper all the time if you angle it to the side come at the side you're going to get a different effect than what you really want so when you want a lot of control there that if you want the airbrush pointing at 90 degrees straight to the paper it's only because of my camera angle that it looks like I'm coming at it from the side now these little tools that I'm using here I've got several and again I'll link those in the video description where I bought all of those some were from Amazon some are from art supply store I I can't remember the other one again link will be in the description but those are so handy when you're trying to get more crisp lines. Now, you don't always want crisp lines. Don't feel like you have to use it for everything that you do. But there are times where my edges, I just wasn't getting in as crisp as I was li would like. And those things really help. And when you have a lot of them, you can almost always find the curve that you want for whatever it is you're working on. That's why you want multiple shapes and sizes. One of the smaller ones I'm using is actually from my flame set. But you can use it for anything. Again, get, getting those nice clean edges where I need them to be. And I can clean them up even more later on with the colored pencil. So I don't need them to be perfect. But I do want to get in the habit. In this case, I'm using this piece as practice, just getting back used to doing details with the airbrush. So I did want to try to get it as detailed as I could without the colored pencil. But I know that I'm going to go back through with the colored pencil and sharpen things up after. See how I'm just doing everything with this one color, just worrying about my values, get my darks dark enough, my lights light enough, I'll put the color on top later. And this just simplified things. It made things, it was a much more enjoyable way to paint too, but it was so much less stress. It was more fun. I wasn't struggling with the color. Now by this point, I had purchased the colors that I wanted, so I wasn't having to mix a lot. But it really, this is so much better than the first three roses as far as the painting process went. Now, as far as when do you need to clean your airbrush when you switch colors? It depends on the color. If I'm going, let's say I'm using this brown and I need to switch over to black, I don't need to clean the airbrush out. I mean, I'll get most of the brown up. That black's gonna take over everything. Now, on the reverse, let's say I'd been painting with black and I wanted to switch to a lighter color. I'm gonna go ahead and run water through the airbrush and then a little bit of cleanser, cleaner if I need to, and then I'll go ahead and load the paint color that I want because that black is going to want to take over everything. And it's pretty much the same. Anytime I'm going from a darker color to a lighter color, I'll go ahead and clean water and and the airbrush cleaner through it. I'm not talking about tearing down the airbrush like I showed you in the beginning. That's when I'm done painting for the day or when I forget and come back a week later and decide to clean it. But wait, in between colors, just to kind of flush some of that paint out. Again, I just use the spray bottle to spray most of that out and then go into another container with water. And the reason that earlier on, and I didn't mention this, I've got water in the bucket when I spray the paint out of the airbrush with the spray bottle. I put that into a bucket of water just because it's gonna keep that from drying. I use my water well. It keeps it from drying at the bottom to where it's hard to, to clean the water well out. It just rinses with water as long as there's water already in there. Now I'm going to go ahead and start airbrushing the pinks on top of this. And I still want to let the white of the paper show as much as I, I can on the areas that need to be really light. And work slow. This is sped up quite a bit. This is a slow process. Be controlled. Be very slow with this. You're not fighting a dry time with this medium, so that you don't need to rush. I'm going to go ahead and switch colors here. 
or just take a break. Looks like we're taking a break. So now I've got a more bright pink. And here, I didn't need to, to clean out my airbrush in between this color, this magenta color. I went from a light pink into a darker one, and it's really not, I mean, once the, the I just run the paint out of the gun, so I'm not leaving paint in there and then mixing it into it. But if a little bit of that is still in the airbrush, it's not going to really be affected when you put the darker color through. Once that dark color starts feeding through the airbrush, you aren't going to notice the other color in there very much. So I don't have to go through the whole cleaning process with spraying water and then a cleanser again. Adding a bit of green. Now these are pretty, cr I mean, a lot of the areas on there are, are pretty crisp. I could have kept going and using those, those stencil tools I showed you earlier and got that clean enough that I wouldn't have even needed to use the colored pencil. The colored pencil just simplifies so much. I love using the airbrushes mixed media. I don't really enjoy trying to make everything 100% airbrush. It's just so much easier to come through and clean things up again with the, the colored pencil after. And it's just such a perfect medium to get, or those two mediums work so well together. Pulling out some brighter highlights with the white. My whites weren't quite as bright as I wanted them to be. Now in the basket, I also went through and I've got the white highlights over the black. I'll clean that up again later. Now back up onto the jars. I'm focusing a lot now on getting my whites brighter and my darks darker. And this is what's going to help it to look really shiny and really like very clear glass, not the opaque glass it looked like earlier. So one of the things that you've got to watch with the airbrush, it's so easy to make things very fuzzy. Pay attention to where you want things to be fuzzy and you don't want things to be fuzzy. It's kind of like digital painting. It's something you often see when people are getting started with digital painting. They have a tendency to make things really, really fuzzy and out of focus. Pay attention. I mean, that's a great thing that the airbrush will do, but if it's not supposed to be out of focus, you know you need to keep working on it until you clean up those edges. And everything I used on the rest of this piece was done with the 0.2 needle. I, if I were to do this over again, I wouldn't have bothered with the 0.3 other than the background. The 0.3 was perfect for the background. It's a larger area. And then all of the detail on the roses and the basket and the jars, that I like the 0.2 better for. So now I'm going to go ahead and come on top of this with colored pencil and start cleaning up edges, refining things a lot more. And I'm using my black polychromos. I'm using the polychromos a lot for some of the smaller details. I, the areas that I need to be more opaque, then I'm going to switch over to my luminance. And on something like this with that fine, of this, there's so much detail. I just really want to pay attention to uh, still my contrast. Get the whites. The brights need to be brighter. Like right now, see how everything's very muted? Those few white details I put on the handle of the basket made such a difference in making that look like more realistic metal. The same thing as I come through here with the wire basket, those little white dots, these little details using the black on the opposite side, the darker sides, and then the white kind of circles to build up. Well, that's where the, the wire is twisted, but those white bits make a huge difference, not only in cleaning it up, but, but getting that contrast in there, it really pulled that wire out. So it went from looking kind of fuzzy out of focus and it pulled it into focus. And the nice thing is with this type of wire basket, it's not perfect. It's like that chicken wire look. It's not perfect. It's, I mean, imperfect. That's the whole point of the, this style of basket. It's not like every single one of these little shapes has to be the exact same shape. It's very, it's supposed to have a very rustic look to it, which makes it easier as an artist. That's for sure. If I needed those to all be exact, that would take a bit more work. Now, part of making things more in focus is actually working on the background, not the subject. See here, I'm actually darkening up the background to make the subject, the lighter area, pop out more because that was a bit fuzzy right in that area. And one of the Patreon postcards of my tiger painting. Now you know what I do with my extra postcards. Now 
and pulling out those highlights. Now I'm not just using white and black. You can see a lot of those, the orange colors, the brown colors. There's a lot of different colors that I'm using on the glass because it's going to be reflecting the flowers, the green. I mean, a lot of colors, anything in the surroundings would be reflecting somewhat on that glass. So I'm going to pull some of those in there, those colors into this. These glass jars, that's another thing. They're, they're supposed to be very rustic. They have a very um, imperfect look. They're not exactly the same. They're kind of wobbly. So again, as an artist, that makes it easier. I don't have to make sure every line is, is exactly the same between all of these little jars. If they were all exactly the same, I would take a, a bit more time, a bit more work, and make sure to perfect the size and where my lines are straight and parallel within all of them. So watch that on your reference photo. If, if the type of work that you're calling or you're called to do on that requires something that is took a little bit more, um, I guess, refined craft, craftsmanship on, let's say it's a vase or something like that, you want to make sure that your edges on both sides of the vase match up. Here, not so much. It's also a bit skewed just based on the angle of the camera. Now I won't do any more airbrushing on this because I've done so much with the colored pencil. I can't go back through if I want this to be remotely archival with the airbrush on top of this. Unless it's an area where no colored pencil has been added. And your shadows and your highlights, they are everything. When you're trying to make something look realistic, don't feel like taking a dark outline or outlining things is the way that you're going to go. It's the contrast and the shadows. The contrast between, like in this case, the rose and the shadow under it. I don't need to take a line and outline things. If, if I feel like I need a line to define my subject and the background, then that's a pretty good indication that I need to work on my values. Something else needs to happen there. Don't try to define things based on outlining the subject. And pulling these pinks with the colored pencils really helped to brighten some of the, the pink on the roses up. Where it was a little bit dull with the colors I had mixed with my airbrush. Some white highlights in there. The Derwent Drawing Chinese White also works really well on top of these. It, it's probably the most opaque colored pencil I've found. Well, definitely not. I don't know why I said probably. It is the most opaque colored pencil. It doesn't get as fine of detail though because it's a very waxy, very thick lead. So it's really good for larger areas, but that's why I'm pretty much sticking to the luminance white on this one. It's better for the small details than the Derwent drawing. Now, if you are brand new to airbrushing, do not try something this elaborate. It is just going to frustrate you. I promise you, when you first start, other than doing out of focus blurry backgrounds, if you're doing that for like colored pencil, you'll get that perfect your first day. Like that's no problem. But when you want to start getting detail and having more control, that's going to take practice. You're going to be terrible at it at first. That is no indication of how good you'll end up being. It's just that we all have that. He it's, a, it's a learning curve. It's weird to hold an airbrush. It takes time to, to really get control of how you're using that trigger, how much air versus how much paint. It takes practice. Don't let it discourage you, but also don't start with something this elaborate that will guaranteed discourage you. Start out with something simple, you know, use a stencil to, to paint circles and practice shading the circles, practice dots, control dots to where that you're adding the dot where there's, you want them to go, that they're not just coming out all over based on how the angle of your airbrush, but just practice smaller things like that first to get the hang of it. And like I said, don't be discouraged if it doesn't come out, if you feel like you're, you just don't have any control of it. It is a very weird medium, completely different than anything else you're going to work in. So like I said, don't be discouraged. You will get there. It just takes practice and it takes time. And I'm not talking you need 20 years before you're going to be able to paint anything decent, but you're going to need to work on quite a few things. Lots and lots of hours are going to need to go into getting you to the point where you're comfortable enough to get the details. But the more you practice, the faster you are going to learn. Watching videos helps, but unless you're actually practicing and spending, putting the hours in, you're not going to get there. So just go Paint something ugly, basically, and don't let it discourage you. Just start. And cardboard is a great way to start so you're not wasting a lot of supplies. You can also start working in black and white. Don't feel like you have to start with your color. Just to get the hang of the, the airbrush, 
do some black and white paintings first. Then you're not even worrying about color. You're worrying about values and you're worrying about just learning how to control and how to handle that airbrush. I think that will help you to get started more than anything else. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to, to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. You may want to also sign up for my email newsletter. It's free. I send out one email once a week, updating you with whatever new videos went out, some art motivation, and updating you with when that live stream that week is going to be, which is almost always Wednesdays.